If you can get him to open one more bottle, you'll be my hero forever. Two doors down from Shopton of the Pop is a little town. So now he's opening bottle eight? That's... Oh! Eight bottles that he opened. And not even one sale. You have got to be kidding me. What's up guys, it's your boy Alan again, back with another video. And today, we're gonna watch another episode of Bar Rescue. But before we start, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And uh, let's go check this out. There it is. Bricks, wine, and gourmet experience. Then over there it says Bricks, Brews, and New York Deli. What is... Uh, is that the same company? If so, why would you choose different fonts? Most wines are consumed in America by people over 40. But yet the largest demographic group for growth of wine sales is 25 to 34. Yeah, the millennials. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of younger drinkers are becoming more savvy towards wine, mainly because the pretentiousness of it has gone down. One of my friends actually became a smelly at 21 years old. So I'm actually surprised, like, how did you taste wine for all those years and then take the exam as a 21 year old and pass? So Rick, the owner of this bar, he doesn't have a liquor license. So all he sells is beer and wine. Did we? Which is fine. Earlier, they said that this guy is studying to be a sommelier. So uh, wine bars can make really good money, especially you don't have to deal with a lot of the legal stuff like licenses that you have to deal with. There's also a lot less liabilities as well. I'm over there, I'm over here. <laughs> so he's $180,000 in debt. He's losing. $180,000 in debt? Uh, okay, that's pretty high. I, I'm like, what the heck did he do to dig himself in such a huge hole? This is a wine bar. Especially this neighborhood is pretty wealthy. It should sell itself. Using four thousand dollars a month. I'm told he has enough money to last another month or two. Oh. Yeah. So he. Ooh. I mean, is that even enough time to rescue this place? That's his wife, Sharon, and she's very frustrated because their fortune is drying up. So there's Tina. She's one of our bartenders. It's a red blend. There's Samantha. She's a bartender as well. Medium. For a wine bar that small, do you really need that many wine tenders? Because with the owner being there, I'm sure that some of the wines could be poured tableside. It's not like a restaurant bar where all the service drinks are made by the service bartender and then you have another bartender who makes the drinks for the guests at the bar itself. For wines, you pour in front of the guests at their tables. Marie and Kevin enter Bricks, a 3,100 square foot space featuring two rooms. The smaller room connects to the kitchen and features beer, while the larger room highlights wine. Oh, so it is the same company. So going back to what I was saying earlier about the font and stuff, the branding should be consistent, especially when you have the same name and it is the same company. Bricks is a term that's used to measure sugar in wine, but it's not a term that's used to measure sugar in beer, at least not as much as it is used in wine. If he really did want to have like a beer and a wine room, I would have just called the beer side something else or just have the business different name you know, something like grape and grain or, you know, something and something, not just bricks, because bricks kind of sounds like your only focus is on wine. So you notice there's two separate rooms. Each room has a bar. So they're on a larger wine side. The wine-centric mm -hmm. side. I'm clean. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one thing I noticed. This adds to the confusion. The kitchen is on the beer side. Logistically, I can't even imagine how the employees work here. What if there was some mistake in the food order that happens on the wine side, then you'd have to go to two different doors just to yell at the kitchen, hey, that thing that I just sent in, the guests cancel it, uh, they change their mind, whatever. The flow, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense. What do you suggest? White or red? Red. What it's is a this? thin blend. What's the price point on it? I do not know. Okay, it's not listed on the menu. Why is it not listed on the menu? Why is the price not listed on the menu? That makes no sense. And if it's not listed on the menu, how come the bartender doesn't know? She doesn't know the price. She recommends a wine, doesn't know the price of it. No. This is our wine expert. Wow. What's the... 
The wine expert will tell you about the varietal, the vintage and everything, but the price is, you don't need an expert to know what the price is. The POS system is right behind you. You can just check. Criteria for being a wine expert. The most important thing I am is a W-I-N-O. <laughs> he's a W-I-N-O. So, at least he's friendly. <laughs> What's this? They actually hired me to look like that. Wait, is that you? It is. Awesome. <laughs> you got an extensive menu. See, he has a really good personality. So that's a plus. We do. Pastrami is the star of the show. My pastrami is the world's best. What goes good with like a pastrami sandwich? Most wines don't. Interesting. He makes his own pastrami. So this guy's also passionate about food as well. What goes good with like a pastrami sandwich? Most wines don't go well with most foods these days. What? Then why, then why do you feature it on your menu? Maybe that's meant for the beer side? In that case, then why not just, maybe the kitchen is small, but you could either have food menu that works well with both beer and wine, but if the star of the show is pastrami and you're gonna say that it doesn't work with wine, that makes no sense. Why even bring it up then? Can I get a pastrami sandwich? So you're looking at this pastrami sandwich, you've got all these really bold flavors. It's too much. Especially That's if you're pairing it with wine. Not to mention yeah. it. Um, yes. When it comes to wine pairings, the main rule, it doesn't matter if it's red, white, whatever, you have to match intensity. I think they talked about recommending the Zinfandel. So yeah, that might work, but still pastrami is very, very powerful. Lots of spices, lots of, you know, salinity. Uh, let's see if they do recommend the Zin. I'm curious, uh, what does, if that's the wine that's gonna be recommended. There's a lot of meat on that sandwich and pastrami isn't cheap. Not bad. Okay. Gone to pee? <laughs> Gone to pee on a coaster. <sighs> they don't check their coasters. So I worked in places where we had coasters. We try to reuse them to be green, but even menus, people are gonna desecrate them and write some random stuff on there. You gotta toss those away, you can't reuse them. Opening shift, you gotta make sure the menus are good. If it's laminated, you gotta wipe it down. If they're not laminated, make sure they're not stained. It's the same thing with coasters. If you're gonna reuse your coasters, make sure they're not stained too heavily. And if somebody writes on it, you gotta toss it. The genesis of this. Most people who decide they want to go to the bathroom usually get their blast taken away. So when they go into the pissa. Oh my they god, it says the pissa. pissa. Oh, come on, your wine bar. Uh, that might work well with a dive bar, but high end upscale wine bar? It gotta be more classier than that. I know that he's trying to be funny and he does have a good personality, but sometimes you have to know your audience. You gotta tone it down a little bit. Do me a favor, taste this wine. What I call this wine is a wine that never met a person that didn't like. I brought this down from Washington State five, six years ago. This guy would rather hear himself talk than actually make a sale. Now look at this. Yeah, he's going into sommelier mode. This is dinner time. You can't just go through every single wines by the glass. Like, I understand his passion, but this isn't a vineyard where you're just tasting stuff. This isn't your little wine club that you have in your living room. This is a business. He's opening bottle after bottle. After bottle. So he's opened three bottles of wine. Yeah. I have... Is he going to go to an unopened bottle? Oh my god, he's going to... Didn't they just ask for red? Now he's going to white? This is definitely serving his own ego. He's, he didn't even pay attention to what the guests asked for. This is the fourth bottle of wine that he's opened. What is he going to do with this wine? Let's hope he's going to sell it to his customers. That's not bad. He's opening another bottle? Oh boy. Mm. She just said it wasn't bad and he's opening, why? She's, that was a sale. Why are you opening? This is the fifth bottle that you're opening. There can't be that many unopened bottles of wines by the glass. We tried a Pinot, right? You know why? How do you go from a Zinfandel to a Pinot? We tried a Pinot, right? So that's called save. That's a little strong. Okay, so you want. <laughs> it's like. We're already at what? What is he doing? Is he trying to sell it or is he just trying to sound cool? Like, this is how much I know about wine. You should try this Pinot, you should try this. This varietal comes with this, this region thing. I was like, did you remember what the whole purpose was? 
doesn't even remember why he's opening up these wines. So, Maria, he's opened six bottles now. Ask him if there's another one that he thinks you should try. I want to try your favorite. This is the Grenache. He's now opened. This is his seventh bottle of wine. Seven bottles? How many wines with a glass? I, yes, it is a wine bar, but a lot of these are not open. Wine, unlike liquor, will go bad. You have to take into consideration that if something doesn't get sold in two days, it vinegarizes. You can't sell it anymore. You can't sell wine that is too old because it's going to be oxidized, acetic acid formation. Lots of stuff could happen. And the fact that he's opening up these bottles, like if none of these sell in two days, they're just going to go down the drain. Yeah. And how many sales? Not one buy. If you can get him to open one more bottle, you'll be my hero forever. Can we try one more? I have... So... Opened an eighth bottle? You have got to be kidding me. Two doors down from Shopton of the Pop is a little town. So now he's opening bottle eight? That's 32 potential glass. Oh! Jeez! Eight bottles that he opened. Let's say these are by the glass on the menu. If you're just doing a tasting, are you telling me that you don't have an open bottle of any of these? Or are you telling me that the bartenders don't know how to sell these wines, that so many of these bottles are not open that he has to open them? There's so many questions I have to ask about what's going on here. Eight bottles that he opened and not even one sale. And the wine recommendations are all over the place. Easily given away $250 at least. He's losing $4,000 a month with his eco. That'll never change. Nice guy. Yeah. Taking the time to spend with his customers. And he's going to white. Okay, so generally speaking, you don't really go from red to white. When you're doing a wine tasting, you generally want to start off with something light, which generally is going to be uh, white. There are a few exceptions. For example, a Beaujolais. Uh, is a red, but it is considered very light and sometimes served in a flight that might include some white wines. But they tasted a Zinfandel, which is a powerful red, and then they went for Pinot Noir? It's all over the place. This tasting makes no sense. And look at that glass. That's a full glass. When you're doing a tasting, you don't need a full glass. A lot of professionals, they spit their wine out because you're not supposed to get drunk. If you're giving away that much to two people, they're gonna be so drunk at the end, they're not gonna remember anything. So even if you spent all this effort trying to educate them, it's all gonna go to waste. You opened eight bottles of wine for them, <laughs> and you didn't sell them one freaking glass of wine. That's about $250 worth of wine. Uh, that part is, I mean, I'm the entertainer. So <sighs> but aren't you looking at your cost analysis, beverage costs? These are things as an owner you have to take into account. This is a wine bar and like I said earlier, like when you open a bottle of wine, it only has two days before it gets sold. Otherwise, the rest of the bottle is down the drain. You have to pay attention to these numbers. He could be losing a lot more than he is right now. And it could be because of this. These wines that are getting too old that they have to throw them out because he's doing these impromptu tastings with wines that aren't being sold in time. He should be really, really focused on looking at these numbers. Why don't you open this in the basement of your house where you don't have to make uh, money? That, oh, I don't know about that. How yes, open a wine club or something and then everyone brings their own wine. Don't do this in your place of business. When somebody is losing money and their wife's future is on the line, they figure out why they're losing money. But not you. Wine when was cost. the last time you did inventory? I know wines that I have that I know exactly. Inventory? He, he's dodging the question. Not good. So we do inventory at least once a month. Especially when you have wine bottles, you're dealing with potentially things that are thousands of dollars. You have to do inventory. How do you know your employees are not stealing anything? What is the beverage cost of your bar? I don't have exact. Time. You don't know? No. So how... He doesn't know. How do you set the prices then? These are things that you can look up online on how to do. And earlier, nobody knew what the price of that Zinfandel was. Generally speaking, a glass of wine would pay for the whole bottle of that wine. Because like I said, you have to take into account that there's a potential chance that if a wine doesn't get sold that's open, you do have to throw it away. It's not like liquor where you can keep a bottle of Maker's Mark or Four Roses in the back 
that will stay there indefinitely. You have this insatiable desire to make everyone in the room happy. But what you're not doing is you're not making yourself happy. Or making any money. How much money have you invested in this, Rick? Uh, probably 180 total. Is that your savings? Retirement? Uh, oh, it was all, everything. He invested his whole savings into this. It's always good to follow your passions and things like that, but he was talking about becoming a sommelier. Why not become a sommelier and then work at a restaurant? Owning a business, you can understand so much about wine and know nothing about wine bars. This is why not every sommelier has their own wine bar. That's another set of knowledge that you need to acquire. And that's why a lot of wine bars, the owners don't know much about wine. It's like a symbiotic relationship. You have the knowledge of running a business, but you don't know anything about wine, so you hire some sommeliers or wine experts, and then you work together. You know, you have a passion for wine. You don't just open a wine bar not knowing anything about business or have any interest in learning about running a business. It doesn't work that way. So your whole retirement is wound up into this. Mm. I got to get you profitable, because what I saw last night and the numbers that I'm seeing are horrible. Well, I don't know where you're getting those figures because I don't see that. Come. That tasting itself is a good example of, I mean, if he just casually just opens eight bottles of wine, not even sell anything. You don't need a computer. You don't need to do beverage costs, labor costs, inventory to know that this is the type of behavior that will set somebody up for failure. Okay. I sat down and looked through your sales numbers and the invoices you gave me last night. Your cost is 40%. So what you're saying to me is bull****. I had part time. Yeah, 40% is way too high. For restaurants, it should be around 30, and then for full bars that don't serve food, closer to 20. So 40% is way too high in any situation that you're thinking of. Tender come in here. Partender is an inventory system. And we looked at the ounces of wine that was consumed in only two days. Interesting. I don't think I've ever seen bartender used for wine in Bar Rescue yet. Generally speaking, a bottle of wine sells about four and a half glasses of wine. In those two days, you poured the potential of $7,500 worth of wine. Do you know how much money you collected? $3,000. You poured away $4,500. <sighs> He's pouring so much away, like I said, wine goes bad after a while. We're not even taking into account the stuff that gets poured away because it's not getting sold in time. What frustrates you when you work here? Somebody asks for a glass of wine and I go to go get it and then it's not there. Who here has sold a bottle of wine and not been able to figure out what the price is? Well, we can't really. How is this possible? You're telling me the wine list doesn't have a price on it? You could be selling like a DRC and not even know how much you charge it. The owner doesn't even know the price? We sell it if we don't know what the price is. <laughs> We've gotten a little better in terms of trying to get the list together. Some of it's financial. To suggest for a moment that there's a cost factor in updating this makes you look like an idiot. <laughs> Did you see that menu? It's just a piece of paper that is like typed up using a web browser word processor. You don't even put any thought into the price. Do you know how confusing that is? I don't understand. Like if you don't hear <laughs> think about how much you charge people, then of course your mindset is not even thinking about profit at all. You have employees that are selling bottles of wine and not even knowing how much they cost. That's having somebody in place to do that and I just haven't done it. My time is, I mean, I'm 17 hour days. But you had an hour last night to spend with Maria. It's not that you don't have the time, it's that your priorities are screwed up. Oh yeah, he definitely has a time. How hard is it to come up with a price? The time it takes you to think of a price is the same amount of time you have to type it into that Word document to print out. You're not even giving your employees the tools they need to sell. It's not just about selling, but how much are you going to charge the guests? You're not making them happy. You're not making the customer happy. You're not pleasing your wife by losing money. I'm working 10 hours a day as a server. Well, that makes you a fool. Okay, if he's working 10 hours a day as a server, shouldn't he know the frustration of selling or when a guest asks about the price of a bottle? I'm sure that's a very, very common thing that happens in a wine bar. The way I make money. I think he doesn't even realize by not implementing systems how much extra he's generating in stress for himself. I don't do systems. 
Ugh, you don't do systems. So you have no system. I've read a lot of books on businesses and it's not just on restaurant businesses, but generally speaking, a horrible system is better than not having a system at all because at least everyone's on the same page. If you don't have a system, what do you expect your employees are doing? You have so many employees, you just want them to do whatever they want? I don't, I don't know how to do them. I need to put well, systems Rick, in place. Rick, how are you going to own a business? Well, I've been doing it for 10 years. And you have not... He's been doing this for 10 years with no systems? Has he never been into a restaurant or a wine bar? A lot of restaurants don't run exactly the same, but you can see a lot of commonalities between them. You can straight up just copy another wine bar system and... That's better than nothing. You'd been doing this for 10 years. How did he survive this long with no systems? Nothing. I do not want to work this hard. I'm 60 years old. I cannot work this hard. Food cost, labor cost. You spent your retirement on this. If you didn't want to work hard, then why didn't you just invest your money into some kind of index fund and let it grow passively instead of working at one of the most stressful things you could do, which is owning a restaurant, or just a wine club and have people just join in and you won't have to lose any money. Everyone's gonna just bring their own wine in. But now you're giving your wine away to random strangers that aren't even paying. I think what's happening right now is he just wants to be a rock star sommelier. This whole thing is just to feed his ego. Like, I don't even know this was intended to make any money. How long have you been married? 15 years. She's disappointed in you, right? Right. It's hard to watch. I want to make changes. I mean, I do I want to make the change. I want to, I want to, tell me what you're gonna do. I have four freaking days. Yeah, I forgot who said it, but a goal without a checklist is just a dream. Everyone wants passive income. Everybody wants to retire happy. But if you don't have a plan, it's just a pipe dream. There needs to be action, initiative. Matthew, what did you think of the wine service here last night? I saw an inability to sell, including wine, the food element of it. Yes. This is so important. The job of the sommelier isn't just to educate the customer. It's also to make a sale. You're not getting paid big bucks to geek out. I heard you say that you didn't believe that wine and food paired well together. That's not true. Most wines don't go well with most foods these days. What? <laughs> That's insane that he said that. That only makes me question his credibility as a wine expert. There are table wines, which are, you know, wines that you can just drink casually, like a rosé at a park or a beach. You don't need to put much thought in what kind of foods you can pair. You could pair with potato chips, crackers or something. But the more serious the wines are, generally speaking, there are foods that people design specifically for that wine. So most people think that wines pair with food, but it's actually the other way around. People create food to work with the wines that grow in their areas. It doesn't even have to be wine. We could talk about beer, we could talk about tea. People have unintentionally always paired food and beverages together. When we order wine, we don't necessarily order food. When we order food, we almost always order wine. We have to understand that relationship. Absolutely. And that's why we've got to make pairing important. Pairing not only is important to get the full appreciation of the wine, but for purposes of business, upselling, it's a very, very powerful tool to generate revenue. Thanks. What I saw in the kitchen was you've got all these really bold flavors. The strami is not in place with the wine bar, and I'm really excited to get in there. Yeah, it works well with beer, but yeah, you gotta have more delicate dishes for your wine side of the business. Those are the promises that I need to hear from you. How do I make money in the meantime? I open you a brand new bar, you fill it with people, and you jumpstart your revenues. And if you think small and act like a server, you'll make the income of a server for the rest of your life. Who is gonna pay my bills? This the is people. all about you, that's a no. You're giving away wines. If you had just focused on selling one of those, you could have paid your own bills. Has this guy never worked a day in his life? We're done. Tell her you're We're done. We're done. I'm at the point right now I might be leaving. This. You are so frustrating because you act like you're smart, but you're a moron. We're done. We are done. What the hell? What? <sighs> it's one thing to not know about something, but it's one thing to know what you don't know. And when you know you don't know, <laughs> then you ask for help. You learn. Don't just pout like a little child. Our recon guys came in and the conversation, the theater of it is what came across. But what's really important to keep these doors open is to have the salesmanship be a first and foremost thing in everyone's mind. When it's coming down. Yes, it is 
great that you're passionate about this. I'm passionate about whiskeys, especially Japanese whiskeys. Not everyone is going to enjoy a Yamazaki or Hakushu. Some people, they just want a shot of Jameson and ginger. That's it. You just have to read your guests. You have to know what sells. We also want to focus on how to get the younger 25 to 35 demo in here. So we're going to show you a couple of really great wine cocktails tonight. We're going to start off with uh, Cure Royale. We're going to start off with Selena Della Nota Prosecco. Oh, interesting. Wine cocktails. I'm surprised they didn't have any to begin with. This will definitely create a brunch crowd that they didn't address earlier on this episode. Okay. Hello. Hello. Hi. Okay. Unmanned bar with this many people at the bar. Why did that bartender leave the bar? Want to do a Bordeaux? We'll do two of those. Two Belgian wines. Oh, did she leave the bar to get the beer? Uh, I, I totally forgot about the beer side. I remember in the, in the beginning, I did mention that it was separated by the wall and I was talking about how the flow is just so confusing. And now we see it in action. If you have service where somebody orders a beer and a wine, how, who gets what? Does the wine tender have to get the beer from the beer tender or does the wine tender have to pour herself the beer and then come back. Sure, I'm not telling you that. You think we should uh, send some food out there to get them hungry? How we doing? We're waiting, man. There is not one order rolling in. OK, I'll get some salt. What? They're not selling any food right now? Or they got overwhelmed and forgot to sell the food? All right. Okay. You are done in this? Yeah. The one POS open tonight. What happened to the POS? Did it freeze? What was that screen? Is there a way we can get that going for the next round so we don't have the Oh, yeah. Backup? Well, it, should. it was working this afternoon. Uh, uh, do you have amber? I do have an amber right now, yes. I will be right back. This is so confusing. The wine tenders do have to grab their own beer. If they're going to separate the wine side and the beer side with a wall, why not just have two different food menus and not mix them up like this? You can definitely do this. I've been to this place where it's a full cocktail bar and a beer garden separate by wall, but consider two different businesses. This is just way too confusing. There's no flow. That's cool, man. Oh. Earlier they said they had oysters. You have your Cure Royale. You know how much you can increase your check average just by selling oysters? And when I have a, any bubbles, oysters, that's such an obvious pairing. It basically sells itself. And what do we want? Mold wine. Mold wine, okay. And the Cure Royale. The Cure Royale. These are all together? Yeah, all together. So three and one. Is there a food run? Did he write any of that down? Uh, I haven't seen any food come out yet. Nor have I, that's why I'm asking. You got any orders yet? No, sir, we have not. Nothing. Nothing. How do they not, uh, don't they want to get paid? The more you can increase your check average, the more tips you make. The first thing you do when you drop off someone's drinks, especially if your bar has food, the first thing you say is, have you had enough time to take a look at the food menu? Can it get you started with any appetizers? Just say something, just don't drop off the drink and that's the end of that conversation. Upsell. Did you get those four chicken and two oysters? Yes. Because they didn't get them in the kitchen. No one's getting food. Who has ordered food and not gotten it yet? So all you have ordered food, how long ago did you order it? Wait, they did order food. Oh my God, there's something wrong with the POS. The tickets, they're, are they not going to the kitchen? Half hour. So you've been waiting for food over a half hour. Any beers, anybody here? I need a light beer and a double IPA. What's that? A light I'm beer on this side right now, so it just said. This is way too confusing, too much verbals. How does their ticket system work? Is anyone managing the beer side or do they always have to keep walking? This is very, very confusing. Earlier I said that having a bad system is better than having no system at all. There is no system regarding the beer side of this wine bar. Where are the tickets? We didn't get any. What do you need? I need a bunch of stuff. Oh, oh my gosh. I, they're, they're not getting sent to working. the kitchen? The restaurant is a customer. What is happening? What happened to the PO system? It was working fine when the recon was there. 
tonight? Yeah. Two chickens. Give me a minute and I'll go find out. Is this thing on? You guys better make sure it's plugged in. Wait, 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 up top. Jesus. Oh! <laughs> it's not plugged in. Why is it plugged in a ceiling like that? It was never plugged in. Rick, none of the orders came up in the kitchen because we're unplugged. Who the hell runs a business like this made out of shipping tape and extension cords? It hadn't pulled out in I don't know when. This is me. Oh my goodness. Is that... <sighs> Those tickets are... <laughs> They're going to be scraping the floor. That backlog. <laughs> Especially they're dealing with raw chicken. That's fried. When you fry chicken, the temperature drops, and then uh, you can't rush it. You can't just simply put multiple batches at once because the temperature would drop too much. You won't get a good sear, and then the chicken's gonna get all soggy, full of oil. So you can't you can't rush this. And we heard earlier that a lot of guests are waiting for their chicken dish. Sure, you know, we just don't want it to come unplugged anymore tonight. You're enabling him, Leah. No, just for tonight. They're using painter's tape. They don't have a real outlet that's on the wall. They have to use that? That's the closest outlet to the printer. Are you kidding me? Forty-six, forty-four. Tickets, tickets, tickets. Is that raw? Chicken should not be pink in the middle like that. That was the bar, Matthew. There are some glaring problems. Two POSs behind the counter, but only one on. You've got three people selling things behind a bar, and they're queuing up, waiting on getting it. That's less time to sell more drinks. So why? <sighs> yes, why are there two POS systems behind the bar? There should be one on the floor for the servers. And it doesn't help that one of it was frozen and nobody addressed it until during pressure test. Why is only one on? Uh, another plug problem. I gave you a mission tonight. You're paying for it. So a lot of POS systems, it's a subscription-like system where you pay monthly. You're paying for the system. Like, why don't you just call the people up and ask them what's wrong with it if you don't know why it's not turning on? I wanted to give you a wine bar you'd be proud of and that your 180 would get paid back. <laughs> Nice. Wow. Yeah, way more modern, especially this upscale area. And earlier they said that the demographic here is younger. A lot of young people, they're starting to get into wine. I mean, the place itself actually looked pretty good before, but this makes it more appealing to a younger crowd. Whoa, that is a cool seller. Can you imagine what emotional response you can evoke when somebody orders a bottle of wine and that door opens, everyone's going to be looking. Oh, Holy right. Wow. Oh my God. Jeez, I, I love the stones on the walls. It makes it feel like you're in a vineyard. Make a hundred to two hundred dollar bottle of wine worth it in an environment like this. I put a leather bar top on that is of a white neutral color so the wine colors pop. Yeah, usually um, when you go wine tasting and you're looking at the color of the wine, also the viscosity, looking at the tears, uh, you, we usually have a piece of white paper that you can look at the, the wine through. But yeah, if the table itself is white, then that solves that issue. Hey, if you enjoyed that, don't forget to check out these other videos as well. And please leave on the comment section on what videos I should react to next. And if you haven't done so already, don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll see you guys on the next one.